Hi, this is Annie Grace with the Snake and Mind podcast. You probably know this, but Dr. John Sarno has been incredibly influential in my life and my work in terms of both healing me with excruciating back pain, but then going on to be really the foundation for what the Snake and Mind was built upon. And I had the opportunity recently to be interviewed on a woman's podcast. Her name is Caitlin Michaels, and she calls herself a mind-body mentor, and she's actually has a podcast called the Mind Body Mastery Podcast, and it was all built on her own healing experience with Dr. Sarno's work, and it was a beautiful podcast, an amazing experience, and I really just enjoyed it so much. I asked her if I could take the recording and share it with all of you, so I hope you enjoy this as much as I did and really get something out of it. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 16 of the Mind Body Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Caitlin Michaels, and I'm so grateful that you're tuning in again today. And so on the show today, I have an amazing interview with Annie Grace of thisnakedmind.com. Um, Annie is uh, an amazing amazing human in this world. Her work is changing lives every single day. Um, And I brought her on the show today because her work focuses on um, alcohol use and, and how the emotions or the unconscious can play a huge role in the development of Um, alcohol dependence, or maybe if you're someone who just finds that they drink more than they would like, or if you're someone who kind of has these two competing voices in your head, you know, one saying like, you deserve it, it relaxes you, and the other saying like, why did I have too, too many? Um, Annie um, kind of shares why that is and and lets you know that you're not alone in, in having those two competing voices in your head. And so, um, so the interview today is amazing. And so stay tuned for that. Um, but I just wanted to give a shout out to my review of the week first. Um, you know, I love my iTunes reviews. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, um, taking a moment to rate and review and subscribe on iTunes. That's kind of how we reach more listeners and get into more, um, more ears that way. So today's review comes from Rachel, and Rachel says, Caitlin is an amazing healer who has a beautiful soul and a way with words. Her podcast is informative, captivating, compelling, and provides the listener with hope of being able to break free from a life of pain. Thank you, Caitlin, for giving us this gift. I look forward to each episode. Well, that warms my little heart, Rachel. Thank you so much for writing that. Um... Yeah. And if you have a moment um, and you can do the same, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so before I get into the interview, I just want to kind of talk about, you know, like, why am I talking about alcohol today? Why did I bring on Annie? Um, This is a chronic pain podcast, right? Um, Well, you know, TMS or tension myoneural syndrome is a, or the mind body syndrome rather is a widely encompassing, um, you know, kind of umbrella diagnosis where it can, it can include addiction in there as, as, you know, the same things are happening with addiction as are with chronic pain. And so with chronic pain, you know, most people who are going through that are, unconsciously. So you're not even kind of cognizant of this fact, but you're addicted to fear and it's hard not to be because pain immediately triggers that fear because we think to ourselves, Oh my gosh, is this going to last forever? When will this go away? I can't sit on a couch anymore. I can't, you know, do this. I can't do that. I'm going to really cut back on my exercise, fear, 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 fear. And so, um, with alcohol, Um, you know, you're addicted to the drink instead. And a lot of times we're addicted to the drink because it seems to calm down our monkey mind for just a moment. And for a lot of us, it also seems to curb our pain. And, um, you know, Annie talks in her book about why that ends up not working and, and how, you know, it seems to do all those things in the moment, And if you wake up the next day and you immediately 
you know, have some regrets or you weren't sure how you got had three too many or, you know, your muscles are hurting because you just slept for 12 hours and you missed your meeting at 9 a.m., um, you know, all of those things lead to more guilt and shame and emotional turmoil, um, you know, because it's hard to control. It's a highly addictive substance. And what I love about Annie's approach is that it doesn't, you know, point a finger at anybody and say, you know, you're an alcoholic, you have a problem. It more so acknowledges the fact that alcohol is a highly addictive substance and, you know, we're all susceptible if we start. And so um, her book is life changing. So if you've ever had the thought like I should really, you know, curb curb my alcohol use for a month or or whatever, um, I would check out her work. It um, kind of takes the fear out of the whole process of giving alcohol up, which is exactly what happened to me when I read Doctor Sarno's book. It was that, you know, like I was afraid of my my spinal structure is getting further injured. I was afraid of sitting, um, you know, on a soft surface. I was afraid of sleeping without a bolster under my knees. And, and his book, the first thing I noticed was like, oh my gosh, he's one by one debunking all of my fears. And so if you're new to this podcast and you have no idea what I'm talking about, I would check out the first five episodes of this podcast to get a baseline education on what is tension myoneural syndrome, who is Dr. John Sarno. I would also check out healing back pain, which even though it's called healing back pain, um, it, in my opinion, should just be called healing pain. And so without further ado, I'm going to get into today's episode with Annie. You're going to love it. So I'm really excited to introduce you guys to our very special guest today. Her name is Annie Grace, and she is the best-selling author of a revolutionary book entitled This Naked Mind, Control Alcohol, Find Freedom, Discover Happiness, and Change Your Life. Her book actually uses the concepts put forth by Dr. John Sarno to essentially like reprogram your unconscious mind in a way that can help you to break free from alcohol. So if you're someone who finds that alcohol has maybe taken on a bigger role in your life than you would like, then this episode is for you. Annie also has an online course where she takes you step-by-step through this unconscious reprogramming, as well as a podcast, which is also called This Naked Mind, where she answers listener questions and also interviews folks who have had their own personal recovery stories as a result of her work. Annie, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. How are you? Oh, oh, I lost you. Oh, I'm great. Oh, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. So my podcast so far has been really focused on recovery from like physical pain syndrome. So I'm really excited to get your perspective on the alcohol dependence addiction side of TMS. And I want to get to your alcohol story in a little bit. But first, I would love to hear your like pain story, if you wouldn't mind sharing that. And like how and where were you hurting? What was happening in life at the time? And how did you come to discover Dr. Sarno? Yeah, great. So Oh, as everybody who probably has discovered his work, it's absolutely one of the most miraculous things that's happened in my life. Um, (laughs) At the time, I had just had my second son. And so I had two really young kids running around. I was traveling internationally for this kind of big career. And I was away from my kids a lot. I think now I know that I had a lot of kind of guilt about that. That Mm -hmm. was both conscious and unconscious. And I started experiencing this crippling back pain. And there wasn't really an event I could trace it to. I thought it was like nursing, Mm -hmm. but also picking up my kid out of the crib. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And um, it was, I mean, I did all the things, right? I did traction. I did acupuncture. I had was on muscle relaxants. I had one of the electronic stimulators that could actually stimulate the muscles um, to try to relax them, chiropractic, all the things. And one day my dad was actually riding up the gondola on a ski mountain and he was talking about this problem 
because it had been three years for me and it was crippling me. I mean, I couldn't get on a a plane without medication. Mm. It was just absolutely horrific. And so, and the medication was, I mean, everything would help very temporarily for a few days, you know, it'd feel better walking out of the chiropractor, but then it would be just right back. And it was just um, so unpredictable. And he was riding up the gondola and this man said, well, your daughter should read this book, Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. And so I was like, okay, so my dad got it for me. <laughs> I read the first part of it and I was like, all right, I'm super skeptical, but I'm desperate. Mm. And, you know, like it goes, I read the book and my pain just disappeared on a dime. I went from not being able to pick up my kids to being able to pick them up, jump on the trampoline, oh uh, move houses, all the things. It was amazing. Wow. So you essentially had what they call like a book cure. Okay. Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. So I, I had one too, which is why like, I'm, I can't stop talking about it. (laughs) Um, so how long after you had that, like that initial book cure, how long was it until you kind of connected the dots about alcohol and its role in the unconscious? It was interesting. It it didn't take too long because I had been struggling with drinking for a while. I was at a point where alcohol was definitely taking more than it was giving. Mm. Um, I wasn't a big drinker in high school. wasn't a big drinker in college, but then I went away to my first job. We moved from Colorado to Manhattan and I was working this career where I was the youngest vice president in this company. And I actually, you know, my boss sort of took me aside and said, Hey, where are you at the happy hours? I was like, well, you know, I don't really drink too much. He's like, yeah, it's not about that. It's about showing up. It's where the deals are done. Like, you need to start coming. Mm. And so I was like, okay. But I didn't really have a huge cautionary tale around drinking either. So I started going. And, um, you know, as (laughs) alcohol is addictive, so over time, I would try to just drink to keep up with colleagues. I'd do a glass of wine, a glass of water, so I wouldn't feel it too much. And then over time, fast forward a decade, um, you know, I was drinking every night. I don't know when the moment was, but I do remember I'd be stressed and I'd go home and I'd want to take a run or something like that. And then eventually it was like, huh, well, I could just pour a glass of wine and do the same thing. Wouldn't Much it? Easier, and so, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no effort involved. And so all of a sudden there was, you know, never a good time not to drink. It was like, you know, it wasn't that drinking it was it was just part of everything. And, um, so 10 years later, I have these two kids and I'm traveling and I'm actually, I was over in London at the time coming back from a work trip and I just had a really boozy trip. And I just realized I was just bringing home the absolute worst of myself to the kids. And, Mm. um, I, the thing was, is I had been trying to control it. Like I had been trying to stop or moderate. And every time I did, I felt really, really deprived. I felt like I was missing out. I felt like um, it was key. And so in that train station, I just was struck by this memory of remembering times when it didn't used to be key. It wasn't key in college. It wasn't key in high school. I didn't need it to have fun when I first got married, you know, and why was it now? And I dealt with tons of situations that were stressful without alcohol. So why now did I need this? Mm. And I was the type of drinker that I could stop. You know, I could stop for a week or two. I wasn't really physically, chemically dependent. So that was even more baffling to me because I didn't understand why it was so hard to stay stopped. Like, why did I feel so deprived? And so really quickly after going through Dr. Sarno's book, I was sitting in this train station. It was months, if not weeks. And just thinking, wait a second, I wonder if consciously I obviously want to be drinking less or stopping, but my unconscious mind just hasn't gotten the memo because I have this lifetime of unconscious beliefs around alcohol that it is important to relaxing, having a good time, you know, even important to to sex and networking and everything. You know, I thought it was just so vital. So every time I tried to stop, I just felt super deprived and miserable and it was really difficult. And I just sort of thought, wow, could this be true? So I sent an email to Dr. Sarno. Um, he was alive at the time. And I got rerouted to a man called Steve Ozanich, who wrote The Great Pain's Deception. Oh, yeah. And big fan. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. So he was amazing. He took, he took a Skype call from me and he did um, 
he stayed on the phone with me for two hours. And I just said, Hey, would this work? Is this true? Could this be possible? Could this be the thing? And he's like, Oh yes. Dr. Sarna has always said this could work for addiction. Like, yeah. absolutely. It's the same principles at work. You're repressing things. And, and I was like, okay, so, so what do I do? And, and he yeah. pointed me towards like Carl Jung and um, his book, obviously read through his book, um, the mind body uh, connection, I think is the name of Dr. Sarno's book and all this other stuff to try to put together this picture. And at the same time did a bunch of research into alcohol. Cause I was like, okay, if I can, if I can bridge this conscious unconscious thing, then I could really be free. Yeah. So this naked mind is kind of like your version of the divided mind, really. Like there's the unconscious and conscious side. What do you feel like are some of the like unconscious beliefs that we as a society hold about alcohol and, and can you just kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah, it's interesting because there, there are beliefs that are both conscious and unconscious, I think, because we believe that alcohol is absolutely key to relaxing or having a good time. Um, but it is, we believe that consciously we make jokes about it. But as soon as we're like, okay, we're not having fun drinking, we don't believe it consciously anymore, yet we still believe it very deeply unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So we still believe it's really important for fun. And then we end up feeling like we're not part of the party. We're not in, you know, in the stuff. And so we have times where we go out and we aren't drinking and we are miserable. And there's a lot of things at play there because alcohol is a chemical. So there's like lots of different chemical and neurological things that are happening in that moment that, you know, it's making you miserable. But equally, there's this just huge belief that is deeply unconscious that it is not fun to go to a concert without getting drunk. You know, it's not fun to be at a sporting event without all the beers. And those things, I mean, we're just bombarded with it. Alcohol is actually the number one largest spend category um, for advertising. Wow. Sometimes motor vehicle, like cars will beat it out, but not for long. It generally holds that seat. So we spend more in America on alcohol ads than anything else. And that's because they work. Yes. And part of the irony of why they work is because we write it off. We're like, oh yeah, right. Well, you know, that's not really true. I'm not going to go and meet the woman of my dreams because I popped this, you know, Bud Light open. But... <laughs> it's still working. You know, we dismiss it consciously and then it's working deeply on our unconscious. So that's kind of level one level two in the unconscious is seeing the people we love, um, our parents, our parents, friends, you know, people we respect. I remember when the Broncos won the Super Bowl, where Colorado people are big Bronco fans and Peyton Manning got up and he's like, all right, I'm going to go kiss my wife and have a Budweiser. And, um, I'm sure it was product placement or whatever. And, but I was just like, oh, no, come yeah. on. But like stuff like that, role models, you know. Yeah. Um, and then our experience confirms it. And that's that's where it gets really sticky is because if you're drinking alcohol to relax, you know, alcohol is a numbing agent. So it actually used to be used in surgeries. They would use it to knock people out in order mm -hmm. to perform surgery until they discovered it was much more toxic and was killing people. So then they would, um, they found less toxic anesthetics. But we then have that experience of our pain being numbed for a very brief amount of time. And so that really reconditions the subconscious to say, yes, this is then in fact, all of these things are coming at the subconscious. So then even when you realize, wow, I'm more stressed now drinking than I ever was when I'm not drinking, mm -hmm. or even when you see a study about the fact that alcohol actually releases adrenaline and cortisol on your body, you, you can consciously say, yeah, that's true. But like your unconscious mind is still deeply attached to the belief that alcohol is important for relaxation. Yeah. So did you ever, like during your back pain years, did you ever think that drinking was actually helping your pain? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure that really <laughs> a lot of people drink for yeah. physical pain. Yeah. And I think in your book you kind of talk about how – it actually ends up increasing your pain. Um, do you remember the science of like why, why that happens? A lot of it is to do with dehydration. So mm -hmm. a lot of like, it actually sucks water out of your cells. Yeah. Um, and so your, your cells are just less equipped to deal with any trauma that's happening anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, it's such a slippery slope, you know? It's like we, we want to numb our pain, and it, it seems to work in the moment, and then all of a sudden, like the next day or the next couple days, it's, um, yeah, it, it ends up making it worse. So, um, so uh, sometimes I will be working with people who are kind of under the impression that um, certain, like, pain conditions are hereditary, maybe because their parents or grandparents had a particular pain condition, and actually, just yesterday, I was out with my brother and my dad at a beer garden, and we were remembering my aunt who just passed last week from alcohol. And we were talking about how her parents passed from alcohol. And so then my brother went on to say that alcoholism is congenital. So being that I just read your book, I started to suggest otherwise. And although we agreed to disagree, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Is there like an alcoholism gene per se? So, you know, they've never been able to identify a single gene or even a group of genes that says, yes, this person is predisposed for it. Um, And if you think about it logically, if we could have, obviously we would do it. Alcoholism, I mean, alcohol itself, just to put it in perspective, you know, prescription drugs every year kill 24,000 people. Mm -hmm. All illegal drugs combined kill 22,000 and alcohol kills 88,000. So it's twice the amount of all prescription and illegal drugs combined. So if there was something we could do to just sort of say, okay, like, let's test for this, um, we would do it. Like, it would be happening. But there's nothing that the neuroscientists who study this have found um, that consistently can predict it. Now, it isn't to say that there can be certainly some genetic components, but the fact of the matter is that alcohol itself is addictive. And I think that's one of the things that's really glossed over Mm -hmm. when we're talking about um, it being a genetic issue right. because it it's very protective for us. We say, well, if I don't have the genes, then, you know, no problem. Like, <laughs> yeah. but the truth is that when they've gotten, you know, mice addicted, all of them get addicted with the right level of exposure and right. consumption. It's not just a, a percentage of them. And that's true for humans too. It's just that certain humans are, you know, dealing with it differently. One of the main things that can be really confusing with it is you say, okay, you know, I see my neighbor or she's falling over drunk all the time and I know I'm not. And so what's, what's the deal here? But people just use alcohol in different ways. So mm. people can be binge drinkers where they only drink a few days a week but they drink really a lot those few days a week, right? And then they're sitting there thinking, well, at least I don't drink every day, so I must not have a problem like, you know, Susie who drinks every day. And then the daily drinkers, like that's what I was, never drink enough to be falling over drunk. Or I mean, plenty, but I had such a high tolerance from drinking every day that even two bottles of wine wouldn't make me falling over drunk. And so I'm looking at the binge drinker who is making a fool of herself, and I'm like, well, drinking every day isn't that bad because I'm not doing that, you know, so that gets really confusing for people. And then I think just on top of that is that often addiction really comes in when we drink for pain because that, you know, emotional pain, physical pain, that teaches the subconscious, like that relief to that pain in that moment teaches the subconscious, okay, this is a thing we want to do again. And if you're drinking completely socially and you limit it to only socially, um, you will have a much harder time becoming addicted because you won't be drinking every day. You won't be drinking to excess. You won't be drinking most specifically for pain. Mm. And a lot of people, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of stories now, and almost everybody can tell me when their drinking changed. And it was usually something happen in their life. For me, it was when I had that second kid and it was super stressful in the travel at the same time, by the way, that my back pain flared up, my drinking changed. And, you know, a woman I talked to, she said it was during her divorce, you know, somebody Mm -hmm. when her parent died. And so we are drinking normally and socially. And then all of a sudden we have a drink when we're in pain and it makes us feel better. And very deep in the mind, we learn, okay, this makes us feel better in pain. And addiction by definition is your brain saying this thing is important to your survival. Mm -hmm. And that 
doesn't happen when you do it socially as easily as it happens when you're doing it for self-medication reasons. And self-medication can be anything from mild, mild stress to serious trauma. Mm-hmm. But that's also why there's such a deep link between addiction and trauma, especially childhood traumas, because those kids, they're 14, they're 15, they have their first drink, and all of a sudden, for the first time, the edge has been taken off this pain that they've been living with. And boom, there they are, right? Right. Now, um, in your uh, work with all of these people that have read your book and taken your course, do you ever have anybody report how they went through your program for alcohol, um, but suddenly their back pain is better too? I haven't had that. Um, It's really a lot of people go to read Dr. Sarno's book, though. So it's because it's like he's in my preface he's in my acknowledgments his whole stories in there so I'm so I'm such a devotee that I just (laughs) recommend it all the time so if anybody's having back pain I'm like read this yes yes good call good call that's really all anybody needs um you know if they absorb it into their subconscious you know um so at this point you've kind of had your book out for um four years five years um two 2015. So oh, three, okay, three, just over three years. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you kind of keep a general idea or track of how many people have been touched or recovered using your methods? Um, try to, it's yeah. really tough because you never know, but right. I mean, we've like the book has sold, uh, over 150,000 copies, oh I believe gosh. by now, which wow. is crazy, which is really cool. Amazing. Yeah. And then I have probably 30 or 40,000 people in like free online communities. Like I started something called the alcohol experiment and it's just like a free thing where people can go do a 30 day challenge. And during every day of the 30 days, they get like a bit of the subconscious reconditioning in the form of a video and an email. Um, and so that has just, you know, wow. yeah, close to, yeah, it's really cool. Very cool. Do you um, have like a favorite recovery story that someone has shared with you as a result of using your book or your course? I think, you know, there's, there's so many different just stories that are, are really, really neat. But I think one of the best is when people are not only heal their relationship with their children. Like I was talking to a woman, I actually had a group coaching call right before this. And she was telling me how um, her eight-year-old, who used to, when she was drinking, really complain about the smell and stuff is now coming and like snuggling up on her lap and stuff like that. So I think the kids that gets me the most, you know, kids really, they're so smart. They really know what we're doing. They know that you're got the vacant eye stare going. And even if you're not like an abusive um, parent, when you're drunk, you're just not quite present. Like you can't, you know how it is when you're looking at somebody who's been drinking, Mm -hmm. their eyes glaze over and stuff. And kids really feel that they really feel disconnected. So I think that's really powerful. And then especially powerful when we hear about those same kids going on to become more mindful in their own, um, their own like experimentation and whatnot. Awesome. So, um, in your book, you kind of talk about how you don't like to use the label alcoholism or alcoholics. Can you touch on why? Yeah, absolutely. I th- I think it keeps us stuck. I mean, the scientific and medical community have really abandoned it. Um, they use alcohol use disorder. And the mm-hmm. thing that's different about that is it's not black and white, right? So alcoholic is you are, you aren't, you're in or you're out. And alcohol use disorder is like a series of 12 questions. And then it goes from mild to moderate to severe. And so you can really have a better gauge of where you are. And just for fun, I'll tell you two of the questions. And and if you answer two, yes, you have mild alcohol use disorder. So two of the questions are, do you have to drink more now than you used to, to get the same effect? Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody I know. Yeah. (laughs) And then the other one is, uh, is there ever a point in time where you wish you would have drank less? So, you know, where you overdid it basically. And so if you answer those two, yes, it's definitely a red flag, which is, is crazy. But back to the question, I think that when you are talking about this black or white definition of am I an alcoholic, instead of just very naturally questioning, am I drinking too much? Would I be happier with drinking less? Like, am I eating too much sugar? Mm -hmm. We don't have a gentle conversation. You know, the, the question that looms is, am I an alcoholic? And that question we put off and we bury deeply 
deeply because it's such a painful question. I, I bet people have TMS just to bury that yes. question. And, <laughs> um, and if we could just lower the barrier to entry to questioning this, because most people aren't, according to the Center for Disease Control, only 10% of people who drink excessively, so this is our of excessive drinkers, only 10% of them um, have a chemical dependency on alcohol. Mm. And so 90% of us are not in that boat, you know, and when we have this, okay, to get help, I'm going to have to call myself an alcoholic. I'm going to have to say, hi, my name is Annie and I'm an alcoholic. That does one thing very, very well. It prevents me from taking that first step to get yeah. help. That brings me to another question. Um, how does your book and your approach kind of differ from the traditional groups like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous? Um, I think what we touched on probably the main way is just in the labeling. Uh, So it's kind of a more, I I also think that my approach is really through Dr. Sarno. He taught me exactly what was going on in my body and that's why my pain disappeared. And so that's what I'm trying to do is just teach you exactly what the dopamine cycle looks like when you drink, exactly why alcohol can numb your ability to feel natural pleasure, exactly what's going on neurochemically. And then that information empowers you. Whereas one of the tenets of AA is that I am powerless against Mm -hmm. this and I'm surrendered to it. And so through surrender, I can overcome it. Um, And I think for some people that absolutely works, but there's a lot of people whose personality will not allow that sort of admission. And so I think my work works much better for people who are headstrong, like myself. Right, right. (laughs) And it's just such a much more empowering stance versus like the victim mentality. It's like, it's like you have the power, you know, and that's what I think Sarno taught me too. It was like, you have the power to be pain free, um, if you choose it, you know? So, yeah. So, um, uh, your book kind of reminded me, it was about like three years ago that I, um, decided to read Alan Carr's book, the easy way to control alcohol. Um, and I read it because my husband and I had this goal to take a month off of drinking. And before we began, I kind of realized that although I didn't necessarily have, uh, a problem, I did realize that it was kind of a big part of my social life. And the thought of giving it up did bring up some feelings, which kind of made me want to even do it more because I was like, Oh gosh, do I have a problem? And so, um, what I noticed about like Alan Carr's book, um, was that once I read Sarno's book, I kind of thought of the two in the same vein. Like I felt like they were both reverse brainwashing. Um, and I feel like your book does the same thing and that it kind of takes all the reasons that you drink and questions them one by one. Um, and in your book, you kind of talk about them as like liminal points. Um, can you kind of talk about what liminal points are and, uh, maybe an example of one? Yeah. Let me go on a small tangent sure. there because it, I, so how I found Alan Carr's book was I was reading a book for, um, for work. I was in marketing, so it was called hypnotic writing and it was about copywriting. And in this paragraph, and I've already written most of this naked mind. I'd done a ton of the research. I'd I'd read John Sarno's book. I'd realized the complete power of it. Like I'm already well into this process. Um, actually very close to kind of, I think I'd already stopped drinking Mm. and no, I had. And anyway, um, I'm reading this paragraph and it said the two most hypnotic books I've ever read are Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno and The Easy Way to, I think it was Quit Smoking by Alan Carr. Oh. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got to get this book. Because <laughs> if this guy did it for quitting an addiction, that the same thing that Sarno did like for pain. And so I got The Easy Way. I actually got The Smoking Book, yeah. which was really funny because then I read The Smoking Book and I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work because – you know, people liked, like people like to drink. And then I found out he had an alcohol book and and then I read that and I was like, Oh, this is amazing. But anyway, just a little side note. So yes. Interesting. Wow. Um, wow. Well, that's that's why they seem the same to me. It was like, they are both very hypnotic and I think I might be susceptible, (laughs) which is awesome. So yeah, so good. So good. Cause all hypnotists is hypnosis is at its core is speaking to your subconscious. Right. So, right. um, just very cool. So, interesting. so 
the liminal points. So that was actually, I feel like I have all of these incredible kind of people who came and taught me just one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a man, his name is Dave Gray. And he actually has a book out called Liminal Thinking. And liminal is the space between, you know, the conscious and the subliminal, It's the Mm -hmm. liminal space. And so his work was all about how you can bring anything unconscious into examination by bringing it into the light of the conscious. And so his method is really, you go through and you say, okay, you identify where the belief came from and what was the circumstances, the experience that, that kind of triggered this belief. And then how did you confirm those? How did it manifest into your life? And then you look at, is, is it true? And I've actually, I have another book coming out at the end of this year, and I've actually kind of distilled it down a bit more and put it in my own words, but it's called the three Ds. So decide, deconstruct, or no, sorry, (laughs) define, (laughs) deconstruct, and decide. So you define the belief, you deconstruct it both internally, you know, where it came from, and then externally, is it true? Uh, According to science, like, does alcohol relax you? Let's look at the science. Actually, alcohol releases is cortisol, the stress hormone. So no, it doesn't relax you. Um, And there's all sorts of studies that that go along with that. And then you decide, is this belief going to be true for me anymore? Is it serving me? And so it's just a way to kind of dig out those unconscious beliefs, bring them under conscious examination and um, yeah, make a different choice. I love that so much. It reminds me of the work of Byron Katie. Have you heard of her? She's like, I, I did not hear of Byron Katie until probably a year ago. And I love her. Like she just did her school of the work and I couldn't do it because we were at a family reunion, but I was like, next time she does this hundred percent, I am going to this no matter what. Um, yeah, I've read so many of her books and I use her work all the time. It's incredible. Yes. I love it. And I love that you're kind of incorporating that like questioning process into your next work. I'm excited to read it. So Annie, how can people kind of find you and work with you? And can you kind of tell us a little bit about your book and your course and your community? Yeah, of course. So um, thisnakedmind.com is my main website. And that's where, you know, you can all sorts of, of good stuff, huge blog, tons of podcasts. My podcast is also This Naked Mind. Um, but if anybody was curious about, and the book is also the Snake and Mind, Bards and Noble, Amazon, all the regular places. But mm-hmm. if anybody's really curious about just putting a foot in the door, dipping a toe, the best thing I think is the alcohol experiment. And it's at alcoholexperiment.com. Totally free, 30 day just experiment where every single day you get some of this subconscious reprogramming so that by day 15, instead of feeling like, okay, only 15 days left, you're like, wow, this is going fast and I feel really great. And then day 30, a lot of people are like, no, I'm going to go another 30 days. So it flips the whole, usually when you take a 30 day break, you've really told your subconscious that it is more important because you've deprived yourself of it for 30 days um, and and missed it and pined over it. And so it actually does the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. But Yeah. um, yeah, that's where I'd start. Very cool. I will put links to all of that in the show notes. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about your work. And um, is there anything else that you want to add before we say goodbye? No, it was wonderful. I really appreciate it. I love that you're doing this podcast. Yay. Well, thank you for your work. I really appreciate it. This is an important conversation, I think, in the TMS space. So I, I really appreciate it. This has been Annie Grace with This Naked Mind Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more at thisnakedmind.com. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe as it really helps us spread the word.